Hey everyone, welcome to part two of this series. Today we're going to start implementing all of the logic to make this game work now that we've got our grid system all finished from part one. So we're just going to start building off right where we left off from that video. So to start with, what I've set up here is a scriptable object just to hold all of our gem types. So right now it's just going to hold the sprite, but we could uh, expand this in the future to have color, maybe points. Uh, and then I'm going to start uh, building a class to actually that we can instantiate in the game. So we're just going to call it gem. The gem needs a type. And all we really need on here right now is a setter and a getter. So let's have the setter method will actually set the sprite on our sprite renderer. And that's it. Super simple class. One thing I like to do here is just add a require component of sprite type sprite renderer, just so I don't forget. Let's make this an expression body there. And that's pretty much it for this class. Let's move on. So let's get back into our match three class here. And first of all, we need some fields so we can reference these in the inspector. Let's have one for our gem prefab and let's have an array of our gem types. And we'll make those up in a second here. Um, first of all, what I'd like to do before I go back into the inspector is just write down some notes of what's coming up here as far as making our actual game loop. The first thing we need to do is initialize the grid, of course. So to do that, uh, we'll iterate over everything and populate in our gems. The next thing is we'll get our player input and handle swapping. And then we're going to have to execute our main loop, which will be... Yeah, I'm just going to paste it in here. What will happen after our code routine? There we go. So we're going to go through the sequence of all of those things. We'll swap animation, check for matches, do some animation replace anything that's empty, check for game over. And that'll be the gist of our main loop. As soon as we're done that part, we need to come back and check for uh, player input. So let's go ahead and start working on this initializing of the grid because I think that'll be the most interesting thing uh, to get done next and we'll have something to work with inside the game. So basically, we just need to iterate over X and Y and then populate gems inside of them. So the uh, uh, copilot is suggesting something here this looks pretty good, but there are some problems. Let's, uh, I'm just gonna extract this into a method here using Rider. I'll just call it um, create gem, I guess. So pull that out. So all we need in here is the X and Y. Now I'm gonna change this method because as if you guys recall, we made a method to position it in the center of each grid position. So we'll change that method. And then here, the constructor is slightly different than what Copilot thought. So let's fix that up. Otherwise, this is, it's almost there. We still need to do one more thing though. We need to assign the gem to the grid object. So let's create our grid object outside of this set value method here. When uh, we'll just handle that separately. We could maybe inline this later or possibly move this into the constructor. That would make sense too. But this will work for right now. So we'll just make a new grid object and then we'll pass that grid object in. But before we do, let's set the value of our grid object here to be the gem. Now I haven't made a set value method yet. So I'm just going to head back over to our grid object class and let's implement a method here. And we just have to change. Well, first of all, we have to have a field to hold this and it needs to be of type T. So we're going to call it gem here. We'll just make a T gem. And then what we pass in has to be T as well there. And that's all we need for this method. Okay, next up, when we left off last time, we were showing a horizontal grid. Let's change this back to a vertical grid. I also think we should move that down into the initialized grid method like so. And let's just call our initialized grid from start. So back over here in the inspector now, we need to start making, well, first of all, let's assign our gem prefab. Now I had made one already that just has the gem and a sprite render on it. And just, I'm going to speed things up a little bit here as I make all these scriptable objects. So you can see I'm just going to make a few different colored 
types uh, based off the sprites that I already have and I'll drag those into our match three game array there and that should be it let's play and just make sure it's all working so that looks good um, not no complaints with that let's probably run it one more time for good luck uh, that looks all right okay so let's move on to the next part so next we need to get an input system hooked up so we can start swapping gems so I'm going to add the player input system uh, that comes with the uh, the new input system click create actions I'm going to name it match three actions and we're going to open that up and have a look at it so just bring it up here all we really need at the moment I'm going to make use of fire but I need one more because I want to get the most pointer position so I'm just going to call it select and this needs to be a vector 2 so let's change this to value and control type vector 2 and let's bind it to pointer position I'll make sure auto save is clicked there and it's you know, our actions are already in the field so that's all good but what we really want to do also is make an ab uh, sort of an abstraction away from it so it's reduces complexity and so that we can plug other things in in the future suppose that you wanted to add AI or something I'm just going to call it input reader so let's have a reference to our player input let's define some actions we want the select action for sure and all I want to do with that, I don't want to fire events or anything with that. We just just read the position of the mouse all the time and return it as a property. So we'll be able to call this selected property anytime and get the position of the mouse. And then yeah, as start, we'll just reference that. We'll define our action as select. I want, um, yeah, let's get uh, the fire action. Fire action is going to fire an event. So let's define that as an actual system event. Let's define it in here. Let's hook it up. I'm going to just call this on fire, nice and simple. And we'll invoke the event whenever the fire action is performed. And always unsubscribe from events. I know it, it kind of doesn't matter here. It's kind of redundant, but it just ought to have it. And then I'm also going to require a component there for the player input. And that's our that's really our abstraction there. So let's make a reference to it in the match three class. Um, so we're going to define our input reader. We're going to have to get a reference to that. Let's make an awake method. And Copilot's making a suggestion, but I just want to get it using get component. Okay, now we got to hook it up for our fire. I'll just call it on selected gem, on select gem. Yeah. So when the person, when the user clicks, we'll we'll catch it with the on select gem. Again, I'm going to call on destroy to to unsubscribe, and yeah, let's work on this method on select gem. So, what do we want to do? We want to know the x y of where the user clicked on the screen. So, using camera screen to world point, based off of what we're getting from our input reader selected, which was our vector two. I'm just going to put a note there. We're going to validate that in a second. But what we want to do here is we're going to say, okay, if our selected gem, which is going to be a field that we're keeping, is equal to the position of the mouse, then we're going to deselect because we've already selected that one. But if it if our deselected is equal to minus one minus one, then we're going to select that grid position. Otherwise, we're going to start our game loop uh, coroutine. So let's start just defining that really quickly here. I enumerator. What we want to take in here is the first position was called grid position A, and then the second one grid position B. And that's going to handle all of our logic in there. Now, quickly, let's define deselect gem. Deselect gem is just going to set our selected gem back to the negative one, negative one vector. And selected gem, we'll set it to whatever the grid position was. Okay, back in run game loop. So, first of all, let's get our grid object A and grid object B. Now we want to swap them, or well, we want to move them. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use do tween just to tween them between uh, each other's positions. So just getting the world position center of the other gem, that's where we're going to move, and then I'll set an ease. We'll define that as a serialized field in a moment. And then grid object B, exactly the same thing. And then the grid, we're going to set the values to the opposites of what they were. And then we'll just wait for the same amount of time as that tween was, 
and set an ease. Okay. Now I just have a couple tidy up things to do. My auto completes there. I want this stack to be a vector to int. I'm going to fix that in other places and you may have noticed just up top there I moved all the swap gem logic into a, another method just called it swap gems. So with all that done let's go back over to Unity and we need to get the input reader component onto our match 3 game. So let's just add that real quick. And with that done shouldn't really be anything else to do. I'm just going to move it up one and let's play. Let's try it out. So we should be able to start bouncing gems around. Okay, that looks pretty good. Yeah. Let's keep going. One thing I noticed there was that we weren't resetting the gem position after so let's just add deselect gem here to run near the end of our game loop. So when we restart the selection process, that won't be an issue. Let's set it in our validation here right now, just so that's out of the way. So uh, what we want to know is, is the user clicking on a valid position in the grid? And we should figure out, just in case, let's make sure that position isn't actually empty. So those are two simple methods to implement here real quick. I'm just going to uh, control period and create these methods and I'm sure Copilot will give me some assistance in finishing these up. I'll just clear it out here. Yep, that looks correct. And uh, it already knows the next one. Perfect. Oops, I escaped out of there. Let's do that again. Yep. One thing we could do here is, yeah, use a pattern match instead of all those conditionals. I don't know if I like this so much, but, you know, it's another way of doing it. One more thing, I tend to just make everything var, usually, unless I have a good reason not to. I'll just maybe do a little bit of cleanup here. Don't need these extra lines. So this video is starting to approach the 15 minute mark. So I think what we'll do is implement the matcher in the next video and all the little bells and whistles, all the VFX and audio stuff. Uh, but it's very close. There's not too much left to do to make this a fully functional game. I'll see you in the next one.